I've had a few days now to use the incredibly well specced M2 Max MacBook Pro with tons of RAM, disk space. This is really the ultimate content creator machine, but I'm actually finding it pretty hard to review. And we're gonna test this thing, and as always, I want to find its limits, like what can it not do, because it can, it can do a lot. So that'll be kind of focused on video editing and some new tests that I wanna run using generative AI. Okay, but what makes this review hard? And the way I thought of explaining it is with the video game analogy. So the last year, I've been using this MacBook Pro. This is the 16 inch with the M1 Max chip inside, and it's been great. Now, in the world of game reviews, there's not a lot of 10 out of 10, and the games that achieve it become classics. They become legendary, like Zelda Ocarina of Time, Grand Theft Auto V, God of War, all these games, will go down in history as some of the best games ever made. And 10 out of 10 doesn't mean they're perfect. It just means that each one was a masterpiece. And I think that's what we had with the M1 Max MacBook Pro. And we need to start with the M1 Pro because this is the first time we've had just a spec bump in this new era of masterpiece laptops. Because before, when I'd review like the 16 inch Intel Mac, there was a lot I was always still hoping for. I was always left wanting, and it was like, it's gotten better, but it's still not there yet. We need all these additional features. It was missing a lot. But now our MacBook Pros have some of the best displays available on a laptop. All the ports that I was missing for so long, like HDMI and SD, and now we have MagSafe backs so that even frees up another USB-C port. The battery life is the best you can find anywhere, and it performs just as well, whether it's plugged in or not. And not to mention, they are crazy fast, way faster than anything that came before. So my first problem is there's only so many people out there that wanna hear me gush about how good a laptop is forever because, I don't know, you want there to be some drama. It's almost hard to find the drama because the, these are great machines. Now the M2 Max has a couple more CPU cores going from 10 to 12 and quite a few more GPU cores going from 32 all the way up to 38. But I'm gonna leave most of the numbers and synthetic benchmarks to other reviewers and instead focus on hands-on usage. What does it feel like? Where do I slow down? I'm gonna start off poking around this Resolve project I recently finished because I did quite a bit of grading in here. So you can see this is tracking the sky just to give you a sense of how long it takes just to go back and forth. What did it say? That was 45 frames. Not too shabby, and I just did that to restore the sky in it. Uh, overall, I've got some effects plugins providing the transform, that is film box. And then on some clips like this one, I also have noise reduction. So this is what I really wanted to see because it is always too heavy. You can see as I play it back, noise reduction does still slow down to 10 frames. This was the one thing I was really curious about and I didn't fully expect it to work because it's always uh, the most intensive thing, but I hoped. And if I turn it off, uh, which I do have other things going on, I have like masks on here and all of that plays back just fine. You can see it goes 24 frames per second. So I'll just let this play a little bit more, but yeah, you can see overall playback is fine and a fully graded, not pre-rendered at all project in Resolve. So I really like to see that. And then I've also got some effects here that can push it a little further. So if I turn this on, I've got some a little more advanced like halation and grain being added to the image. In the final version I uploaded to YouTube, I only had halation turn on, I actually turned off grain because it looks so bad compressed, but let's turn it on now. And it actually can't play back smooth with the grain being added. So it's going at 14 frames per second. Based on Apple's keynote, we were told to expect 20% better CPU performance and 30% better GPU, which is a pretty nice year over year bump. But before anybody starts comparing this too much to the M1 Max, I mean, nobody should be upgrading if you have an M1 Max. Those computers are still great, you're fine. Like give it a few more years. So most people are still gonna be coming from an Intel Mac or you know, maybe even a Windows machine. So it looks like general color grading, editing all works well. Let's turn that noise back on and see what this is like for exports. I'll save these as H.265 exports. By the way, this is all shot on the Canon R5 in 4K, so these are H.265 files. I did not transcode them to ProRes, but I'd get better performance and probably quite a bit better because now the hardware decode encode engine on the media engine can offload the ProRes encode and decode, so it should perform a lot faster. But I'd love to know in the comments, like, do you still use ProRes? Because I've been using it less and less as these machines get faster. And now it's time to get out the M1 Max for a bit of a comparison. Now the exact same project exporting from the same SSD.
So the M1 Max came in at 11 minutes, 39 seconds, and the M2 Max came in at 10 minutes, 25 seconds. And now let's move to Final Cut Pro. I've already tried this test, and I know it's a little bit more interesting results. So I created a stress test last year. I'm just gonna start playing these back for the M1 Studio uh, test that had the M1 Ultra processor in it. This has a wide variety of footage. So this is 5.6K HVC footage coming from Panasonic. Both are playing back smoothly right now. It's got my transform LUTs, link in description if you uh, want to put some presets on there. But then next we're gonna see a transition. Okay, so that was a transition that comes from Motion VFX. And you can see that on the M1 Max, it can't get through that smoothly. Let's just play it again. Final Cut doesn't tell me when it drops frames, but I can see that they're being dropped here. And I just wanna emphasize that the speed of export, which is easier to benchmark, so you can show numbers, is often not nearly as important as the fluidity of moving through the app, like being able to scrub through video, make changes quickly on the fly, and just keep editing is often more important than the export time at the end. So let's focus on this, it's actually really significant. We've also got some titles here that are playing. There's a spotlight effect being added, a whole bunch happening, and some 8K footage. This is on an 8K timeline. Starts off okay, but it starts to get choppy really quick on the M1 Max. Can't really get to the end of the clip smoothly. Oh, and plus I had an extra filter on the M2. Okay, but that, that's what gets interesting here. So let me show you what I've added here. I've got a bunch of Motion VFX plugins all stacked on here. If you wanna know which ones I like, there's a link in the description for that. But a bunch of these are all stacked up. So I've got things like Vintage Look, let's start with that. And I'm playing this with 6K raw footage out of the Red Komodo. And uh, okay, looks like they're both playing smoothly. That's great. And now I'm gonna turn on that Vintage Look. Let's watch it again. Instantly. I see a lot of drop frames on the M1 Max, and the M2 Max is playing back completely smoothly. There are no drop frames there, and it's really stuttering on the M1. So, th I mean, this is the most significant difference, but here, wait, this, this gets way crazier. Okay, let's, let's, um, let's add film grain to both of them. Playback, see how it does. Kind of similar, we see a stutter. Okay, but now let's, let's add some more. Um, let's just add them to the M2 Max. So I'm adding Kaleidoscope. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> and Prism Effect. And Light Diffusion. And Lens Flare. So now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six different effects all stacked on top of it. And I'll play them back at the same time. And it's still completely smooth on the M2 Max. And it, I mean, like barely anything's happening in, in comparison. So yeah, we've got red raw footage playing back with tons of effects stacked on top of this. That's usually what slows things down is as you add different layers, most computers right now can handle 4K footage. So now I've got 8K raw playing and plus when you stack filters on it, have multicams, all that, that's what really slows down modern machines. And I'm seeing a massive jump in what the M2 Max is able to handle here in Final Cut Pro. And I know sometimes there's a battle between video editing software. I jump between Final Cut and Resolve. I don't really use Premiere much anymore. But last year I did a performance test of all three apps next to each other. And what I really found is in most cases these days, Resolve is just neck and neck with Final Cut in terms of like playback and export times. Resolve is really well optimized for these Apple Silicon chips. Next, we're gonna test some of the latest AI image generation. And what's really exciting about this is it can run locally. So it's not going on in the cloud, the machine is gonna do it itself. And what's amazing, like I'm shocked that this happened, is Apple actually wrote some amount of optimization for stable diffusion into Mac OS. And I don't know the exact details of it, but they are paying attention to this and staying on top of it, which is impressive. The app we're gonna use is Diffusion B. We'll start with a simple text to image prompt. We'll say mermaid vlogging under the sea. Okay, and hit generate at the same time. Whoa, okay, I can just see the difference. I don't need to stop watch for, and it's done. Wow, those images are, are all pretty bad, but the M2 had a pretty good lead. Let's try another one. Okay, I've turned up the amount of steps. I've got a much more complicated prompt. Let's see what that does. And while these are running, let's just acknowledge there's all sorts of copyright and ethical issues with generative AI, and the world is gonna have to figure that out. It's not really what I'm exploring. In this example, I just wanna see how do these computers take advantage of Around the one minute mark, both of them just started up their fans basically at the exact same time. Machine. 
So the M1 was two minutes, 33 seconds, and the M2 was right on two minutes. So you start to see the difference more substantially there. That's, that's what, 20%? percent faster? Is that right? 20% greater performance. I've only had the M2 for a couple of days now, so I haven't been able to do all the tests I'd like to. But fortunately, I got to sit down with two of the people responsible for the new MacBook Pros, Doug Brooks from Mac Product Marketing and Kate Bergeron, who's the VP of Hardware Engineering. And that whole video is over on my second channel. All right. Well, Kate and Doug, I really appreciate you guys coming on here and congratulations on a huge week, a big surprise to a lot of us. The teams have been working really hard, so it's it's wonderful to get these products out and see what our customers are gonna be doing with them. How do professional workflows interact with your design decisions? You know, you guys have some awareness of what pros like us are doing. What's that workflow like to kind of determine how to optimize for it? I think one of the most tangible uh, examples over the last couple of years has been our investment in the pro workflow team where we've actually been able to um, bring creatives in-house under our hardware engineering organization to um, you know, help really direct um, you know, performance targets and really meaningful um, performance gains in the context of a creative. Um, now you can play 24 frames per second of a raw video codec in real time. Like that's a, all of a sudden from a can't do it to a can do kind of a situation. And I think Doug's right now, because that's an internal group to us, we can literally sit down with those folks and dig into, you know, these meaningful metrics, understanding what the trade-off means to the overall system design and, and talk about how we want to maximize those types of performance. So it's it's nice to have that all in-house now. There might be something in a workflow where, you know, something's just a tiny bit slower or a dialogue pops up all the time that really interferes with your creative flow. And to be able to go deep code inspection and go figure out what's happening at that moment in time is so powerful. Like right then and there, what just happened? Let's go figure it out. It's just awe-inspiring when, when those moments happen. So like I said, head over to my second channel for the full podcast interview or check out some of my M1 tests to see how we got to such a great place. And I'll see you in the next video, guys.